Hey guys, this is Onya. I recently uploaded a video of of the Jubilee series, and I'm going I'm uploading another one now. This this video particularly, continuing the study that I have been doing with Jackson Snyder's group on the Book of Jubilees. We're going through the entire book, and in this series, uh, this video uh, of the series. I focus on the basically what falls after in Abraham's life, after the moment of when he became circumcised and circumcised his family. What comes after that, of course, is Isaac's birth and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and the whole incident with Lot and his daughters. And then, talk, you know, there's discussion about how angels interact with. Abraham and people in general. That's discussed in Jubilees, and I touch upon that. Also, the big major thing, not in the book of Genesis, but the major emphasis that Jubilees reveals to us, is the origination of the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot, and the messianic connections, the amazing vision that Abraham had of the Messiah. That is, I, I, talk, I talk about that, and then we, we also touch upon a little bit of of Abraham's love for Ishmael. Genesis misrepresents how Ishmael is regarded uh, in our copies, uh, but in Jubilees, the correct understanding of the Hebrew behind Genesis is revealed that it's not, Ishmael was not um, cast in a negative light. He he was loved by Abraham, and Abraham continued to love Ishmael. There was no malice or ill will towards Ishmael by Abraham, nor was there any animosity between Isaac and Ishmael. So that's something I talk about, and then the I focus at the end of my, this video on the sacrifice of Isaac, and I show how our understanding of Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac is completely different than what the truth is. Basically, we try to justify how it's possible that Abraham could be commanded to do such a vi uh, horrible thing, right? Well, in this video I explain how human sacrifice is not inherently wrong, and why Abraham was willing to do it. Um, so that's a major thing that I think once you understand that, it really changes your perspective on on morality. Once you realize that morality is centered on the creator and not on man's private interpretation and man's uh, subjective cultural norms. Once you apply a more logical, consistent basis to how you view morality, our whole perception of the story of Abraham almost sacrificing Isaac, that, that perception changes. And a lot of people cite that story, like atheists will cite that story as an example of how the Bible is evil. This video shows how the Bible is not evil for the whole human sacrifice thing. So I think that it's uh, very compelling when you approach it from that perspective that I do in this video. That's pretty much the gist of this Bible study that I have done in for Jubilees, showing how Jubilees gives great insight into these topics that Genesis does not, and essential information is revealed to us in, in, through Jubilees and its connection with Genesis. And I just want to say that if you support the work I'm doing, please consider supporting me through various means, either monetarily or through support of your time. You could you could volunteer to help me with different projects I'm doing. There's many ways people can try to help and assist. It doesn't have to be just through money, but if you do feel led to send some money, that would really be a blessing and uh, I would definitely seek to use it for good. So if you want more questions on exactly what my ministry is about, just 
contact me, private message me, and I will definitely explain to you what my goals are for this ministry and my other ministries connected to this. Because I have many goals beyond the Bible Project. I also have the goal of, of establishing community and social reform, helping people in need. So I can do more videos about that in the future, but I'll leave it there for now and enjoy this Bible study, guys. Shalom and Yehud bless you guys. All right. Thank, thanks, guys, for coming to this Jubilees session. We'll be going through Book of Jubilees, studying it as a as a I, I, I study it as a a biblical text on, on a similar level with Genesis. So you might not people might not necessarily agree with that perspective, but it's kind of interesting to see what you can possibly glean when you approach the book from that angle. Uh, because the Dead Sea Scroll writers uh, held jubilees on a very high level of authority, so we're trying to you know em emulate the Dead Sea Scroll people, uh, learn from them. Maybe not copy everything they did, but uh, they certainly had a lot of insights. And we we're studying jubilees because it it appears to have a lot of insights into the Torah. And the Torah is, you know, central to the faith of the Bible. So for those who haven't followed up on the previous sessions of Jubilees, uh, just a quick overview, you know, the book of Jubilees goes very similar along the lines with the book of Genesis, but it appears to be based on earlier sources, like, like in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's a book called the Genesis Apocryphon. And uh, it, the Genesis Parkfon portrays itself as writings from the patriarchs, like, like uh, there's like a book of Noah, book of Abraham, and the idea is that whoever wrote Genesis used Genesis Parkfon as their source, and likewise, whoever wrote Jubilees used Genesis Parkfon as a source. So it um, it goes over the life of the various patriarchs from the beginning from Adam all the way to to the time of Moses and it gives a lot of extra and jubilees that we don't get elsewhere and so we've been going through and we're now we've been going through the jubilees in these uh, uh, last couple months and we are now uh, where we're currently at in jubilees is we're getting close to the end of it. we're kind of like in the middle of Abraham's life so we're we're going to talk today about things that Jubilee says about uh, Abraham, which I think are interesting. So I have the outline. I'm going to go to it and start going through. Okay, so we left off last time with the with the circumcision, and um. Okay, we see that um, the spirits are, it says um, in Jubilees that the spirits are appointed over every nation. Like, um, you know how there's a 70 nations? Well, according to Jubilees and Enoch, it actually tells us that there was like a specific angel given as like a leader over each nation and um if if the people followed that that spirit into sin that that spirit had authority over them uh whereas for israel we're told in jubilees that there was no angel or spirit appointed over israel and it says that yahuwah himself was over israel and so it says in Jubilees that he would be the one who protects Israel. So all the other nations, all the other nations have like a, have a, an angel over them or something. But Israel is the only nation in the world 
scripture to have Elohim himself directly protecting and maintaining and um, blessing Israel. So that's why we see Israel has been preserved through all these generations is because there's a divine protection uh, because Israel, as Jubilees and other scriptures say, was chosen to be his firstborn. It says that Jacob was the firstborn or Israel was the firstborn of Yahuwah. And Jubilees uh, strongly emphasizes that aspect. That Israel was chosen to be the special people of the Creator. And we it places special emphasis on the importance of circumcision and basically tells us that it warns us that Israel will, will forsake circumcision. And if they forsake circumcision, that's akin to forsaking the covenant. People might not think it's a big deal to not circumcise, uh, it, for Israelites not to circumcise their kids. But if they don't do that, that's a, um, a forsaking the covenant. And if you forsake the covenant, you're, you're not under the protection of the covenant. And it says in Jubilees that if the covenant is forsaken, they would be removed from the land. So it connects the idea of, of the exile with the idea of not keeping faithful to the covenant. So circumcision is very important for preserving the covenant and, and keeping Israel pure and holy and to restore Israel to their full purpose in place. They need to be circumcised. And I don't believe, like there are a lot of people who believe that circumcision was done away with, with the New Testament. But I don't think that's true. I, th I think, you know, there's a, there is a biblical basis to suggest that perhaps that Gentiles may not have to be circumcised. But, but um, to say that the covenant of circumcision that was made with Abraham and Israel is no longer valid, that's simply unbiblical. And I think... Uh, Jubilees definitely supports that perspective that it's that it's not valid that circumcision will always be a special covenant with his people um, but it doesn't mean that everyone who's uncircumcised is sinning or is um, not going to be saved because that wouldn't be fair to to, to, the, to the world um, but for those who are in covenant they do have to follow that to be to be righteous I believe so then what's interesting it says let me look up that passage it's, it says for those who don't who are not circumcised among among israel for those who do not circumcise themselves there will be there will no more be pardon or forgiveness unto them so that there should be forgiveness and pardon for all the sin of this eternal error so it characterizes Israelites not circumcising their kids as an eternal error that they won't receive forgiveness and pardon for. So the way Jubilees is presenting it is that uh, basically in order for Israel to receive pardon, they need to be circumcised. They need to be faithful to the covenant. So there's an important principle in Jubilees that obedience to the covenant is required for Israel to be accepted by the creator. If Israel forsakes the then they won't be forgiven. They won't receive pardon. So it's very important that if Israel wants to be forgiven and pardoned, they have to return to the terms of the covenant. And that doesn't mean like right now, Israel can't do sacrifices. So it doesn't mean that the whole Torah has to be kept, but everything that Israel is able to do right now, because they don't currently have a priesthood. So, you know, if you, if you have an Israelite friend, you can't say to them, you have to do sacrifices or else you're sinning because that's not fair because it's not, it's not their fault. It's not their fault that they can't do circumcision, uh, excuse me, they can't do sacrifices because they're not the ones who are preventing the temple from being built. It's the Israel as a nation is the one who is not allowing the temple to be built yet. But as individual people, it's not their fault. So... They're not going to be condemned for not keeping the parts of Torah that they can't keep. But the parts that they can keep, Jubilees enforces this understanding that Israel has to return to the terms of the covenant and start keeping 
the commandments that were given to them if they want to be forgiven and pardoned for their for their sins. Now I'll move on from the circumcision and we'll go now to the narrative of of um, it says it, it, the whole when when the, the birth of Isaac was announced to Abraham and Sarah and, and Sarah laughed it actually says in like in Genesis it says that let's look up let me look that up for a sec um, it says um, First it says, Yahuwah appeared to Abraham, and then he looked, Abraham looked at his eyes and saw three men standing by. And then it says, Sarah laughed within herself. And then, and then it says, uh, Yahuwah said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Uh, and then a little bit later, it says, Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh. And then it says, and he said, no, but you did laugh. That, that's presented as Yahuwah speaking to Abraham and Sarah. Jubilees, on the other hand, gives a slightly different account of it, where it says that, uh, it says that the angel, the angels, um, Jubilees is one of the few books that suggests that, like as the New Testament says, that the law of Moses was given to Moses through angels and Jubilees is written from the perspective of angels talking to Moses saying we uh, um, we did this it's actually angels uh, talking with Moses and saying things from their perspective that happened throughout the history of the patriarchs so in chapter 16 of Jubilees we see that the angels are saying that we appeared unto Abraham and we talked with him and we announced to him that a son would be given to him by Sarah his wife and it says and Sarah laughed for she heard that we had spoken these words with Abraham and it says and we admonished her and she became afraid and denied that she had laughed on account of the words and we told her the name of her son as his name is ordained and written in the heavenly tablets Isaac and when, and that when we returned to her at a set time, she would have conceived a son. So what this tells us is that either Genesis is corrupt, and currently it says that Yahuwah is speaking, said those things to Sarah, or the fuller story is that both Yahuwah and angels both were talking with, with Abraham and Sarah about these things. Um, it says, uh, like, let me see again for a sec. Uh, so Genesis said, why did Sarah laugh? And then said, no, you did laugh. That's, that doesn't, that doesn't sound too harsh. It's just saying, no, you did. Whereas Jubilees actually says, um, we admonished her. Um, it, it sounds like there's more conversation that was had because it also says what I read was that we told her the name of her son and we don't see that in Genesis we don't see we don't see Yahuwah telling Sarah you will have a son his name is gonna be Isaac but Jubilee says that the, that the angel said that to Sarah so there does appear that there is a fuller conversation that's not currently preserved in Genesis. Um, now, another thing that's very important for our time period today is the uh, the, so the sodomites, the sins of so of Sodom, and what what it tells us is that about Sodom, it says. It doesn't give us much detail in Jubilees. It kind of just uh, briefly summarizes the, what happened. It says basically he, he executed judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah and Zeboim and all the region of the Jordan. He burned them with fire and brimstone and destroyed them until this day. It tells us the reason. It says, 
their works were rick wicked, they were sinners exceedingly, and they defiled themselves and committed fornication in their fle flesh, and they worked uncleanness on the earth. So it's very emphatic in Jubilee that it's because of their abominations and uncleanness that were destroyed. And people might say, that's just, that was just Sodom and Gomorrah. That, that was a one-time thing. But according to Jubilees, it tells us that the, the angels are portrayed as saying, God will execute judgment on the, place, on the places where they have done according to the uncleanness of the Sodomites, like unto the judgment of Sodom. So the idea is, um, if, if cities are as bad as Sodom in the same way, they will be judged in the same way as Sodom. So, you know, a lot of people comment on places like America and they say how horribly wicked America is because of, um, because of you know, homosexuality and all the uncleanness. Uh, um, there's a lot of sexual promiscuity, uh, a lot of horrible stuff. But that's a negative way of looking at it. But on the other hand, we do know that according to Genesis, it was said that Yahuwah would not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah if there was at least 10 righteous people. 10 righteous adults, basically. Um, because it, obviously it's not counting babies, because in Sodom and Gomorrah, there were, clearly there were babies that were innocent, but babies weren't considered righteous. They were just considered neutral, because they hadn't done anything to be considered. You're righteous if, you, if your works are righteous. And babies didn't have any works. When they're, when they're born, you don't have any works, so you're neutral. So Abraham was told there has to be at least 10 righteous people. And that, so by um, derivation, we can kind of understand that that's referring to adult people. So if there was at least 10, we were told he was not going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. So it's a similar principle. But Sodom and Gomorrah, I believe, were cities. They weren't like huge nations necessarily. I think they were cities. So um, his judgment is more on cities. You know, there are some cities in the U.S. Are, that are horribly corrupt and overrun run by animals. I forget which city it is, if it's Ch Chicago, or I can't remember which city exactly. But there are some cities which are have high crime rates and they're overrun by wild animals. And that's because those cities have a lot of wickedness. And what we can glean from telling us that if, you, if, if any city is as wicked as Sodom was, it will be destroyed in the same way. It will have catastrophic destruction. This is an important principle that uh, it still applies to our day. A lot of people think that that's just in the Bible days, but it still applies. And um, and some of it, some of it is uh, through nature. Like um, some of the, some of the punishment comes through uh, through the way the world is set up scientifically. Like so. The Torah says there's blessing and cursing, blessings and curses for obeying the law or disobeying the law. If you disobey the law, there are curses associated with it. And one of the things that makes a lot of sense is the laws of uncleanness. Like if we do uncleanness, um, like if we eat unclean animals like pork, things like that, well, there's a lot of diseases in those things. And, you know, people can get STDs. And so the fact that we're told to wash ourselves after we have sexual relations, that makes sense because if it is, if those types of fluids are conductors of uncleanness very easily and disease, well, it makes sense why we would be being told to wash ourselves, purify ourselves from the uncleanness because if you don't, uh, disease can spread. So the sins of Sodom, which were uh, included homosexuality but was not limited to it, um, even if they're not destroyed like Sodom, they could still be punished in a similar way because their sins may come back at them uh, with, by getting diseases. And we know that like for, with AIDS, HIV, you know, uh, that's a way. That's one of the ways where people are punished uh, for their sins. But we do know that, unfortunately, some people, innocent people, um, are harmed from that, like uh, babies that are born to someone with HIV, I believe will will get that as well. So it's not their fault. But um, in general, these diseases are there 
to serve a purpose of punishing punishment of sin. And so whether it be through the fire from the heavens destroying a, a place like, like happened with Sodom or whether it be through disease destroying a place, um, we're just told that there will be destruction for places that are as wicked as, as Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, now, what's interesting says, it says, you know the whole thing with Lot and his daughters, you know, Lot slept with his daughters when he was drunk, um, but what's interesting is Jubilee says that such had not, when, when he, when Lot and his daughters committed that sin on the earth, the incest, such as had not been on the earth since the day with his daughters. The implication of Jubilees is that from the time of Adam onward, all the way up to the time of Lot, no one committed incest in that wicked way. Um, we watchers were doing all kinds of abominable stuff, uh, having relations with all kinds of, with people, with animals, and doing hybrids. Um, so there was wicked sin at that time. And Adam was alive in the days of the Watchers, according to the Book of Enoch, and according to the Jubilees and the Samaritan Torah. Adam was actually alive when the Watchers sinned and mixed with, with the various uh, sexual sin. So, but after that time, after the flood happened, it was purified, and according to the abomination of of incest up until the time of Lot. Uh, but when Lot Lot did it, basically Lot was the first one from the time of the flood up that uh, did um, incest. And so we see Jubilees gives a strong, harsh warning that uh, the children of incest are, appear to be cursed, according to Jubilees. Um, at least, at least the Moabites and Ammonites were. It says that it was commanded and engraven concerning all his seed to remove them and root them out. Uh, and that may be because uh, children of incest, you know, they, they are horribly diseased, uh, typically, and have whole, all kinds of horrible birth problems. And it just keeps passing on to the next generation. And there is important about importance about preserving the genetic purity of people. So um, we do see that principle of Jubilees that offspring of incest, um, it doesn't really, let me see, actually there is a place in the Torah which appears to have something similar for like, uh, let me look at that for a second, it's in Leviticus. Um, it's either in Leviticus 8, So it says, um, it's slow at the moment, hold on. Okay, so it says, um, whoops, hold on. Um, I'm using Bible Gateway, and they limit. They limit when you're using copyright version. They limit how many chapters you can see. So, one sec. okay. So here's an example. It says. Um, it says, if a man lies with his uncle's wife he has uncovered his uncle's nakedness this is a leviticus and it says they shall bear their sin they shall die childless man takes his brother's wife is an unclean thing he has uncovered his brother's nakedness they shall be childless um on on children and uh the children are supposed to be from a a pure uh parentage so Another example is like the woman uh, commits adultery but is suspected. It's, it's not clear 
if she's adulterous or not. Uh, there's, she's supposed to take a special drink that will reveal if she is um, guilty or not. And what's interesting is that it appears, I could be wrong on this, but it, it's at least some translations make it sound like if she's guilty and takes the drink, it causes her to have a miscarriage and, and the baby dies. Um, so it seems like there is this principle of, uh, of purity of children. Um, on the other hand, it does tell us that if you conquer, if the Israelites conquered a nation, the, the babies were to be spared as well as, as um, innocent women who were virgins um, and children. They were all to be spared. Um, there was a few, there was exceptions, like with the, the very wicked nations, apparently the babies were to be uh, wiped out. And it's a difficult thing to understand. Why would the, why would God or Yahuwah, why would he tell us, why would he tell Israel uh, to babies? Like, that doesn't seem like loving creator. Why would he, why would he do that? Well, the only thing I can think of that makes sense to me of why that might be possibly the case is I could see it if, like, if there's, like, a, uh, if, if certain people have, like, a, a we, we generally believe that it's acceptable to kill people in self-defense. Like, if, if someone, if someone uh, is trying to kill you, we believe it's okay to defend yourself. Also, if someone's unintentionally trying to kill you, they don't realize what they're doing is about to kill you, it is also acceptable to defend yourself. Um, even if they don't understand that what they're doing is almost about to kill you, you can still defend yourself and protect yourself. So from that perspective, if, like say the Canaanites, the, the, all the Canaanites were supposed to be, um, um, all of them were to be wiped out. So it may be that the Canaanites had really contagious diseases that if if they kept the babies, the babies would have spread these horrible diseases and tons of Israelites would have died. So that may be an explanation for uh, why they might have killed all the people of certain nations if there were like really bad diseases that would have threatened the life of Israel. That's the only thing I can think of or why it might be acceptable. Um, but so it's just, there is a principle of um, if there is horrible disease in, in, uh, in, in, um, children that that's, it's best to not allow that to continue. Uh, I don't know if this is how genetics works necessarily, but if, if each, let's say someone has a horrible illness that causes you to die when you're 20 years old. Okay. And if that illness is guaranteed to pass to your son, to your offspring every generation it would seem to be fair to, 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 to perpetuate to perpetuate that illness for every generation it, it wouldn't be fair um, that's not to say that like I don't, I don't believe that you know like if you find out your kid has a illness that you should that you should abort I'm not saying that what I'm saying is um, if you have a disease, then maybe some people, maybe it's not for them to procreate. You know, the command, there's a general command in Genesis to be fruitful and multiply, but maybe certain people should not be fruitful and multiply because if they do, they'll be spreading disease. Um, so that's a, it's a principle that Jubilee seems to, to s s talk about. But anyways, uh, I'll continue. Now, uh, we know in Genesis that there were two occasions where there were two occasions where Abraham's wife Sarah was taken from him by another man. The first time it was Pharaoh. The second time it was um, by Abimelech, I think, or Ahimelech. It was a leader, a leader of Gerar, I think. Um, Genesis doesn't tell us how long the, those events happened. What was it? Abimelech? Abimelech. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, 
Genesis doesn't tell us how long those two things happened for. But according to Jubilees, we are told that the first one, when Pharaoh took, um, it's either Jubilees or Genesis Apocryphon, but as I've discussed before, Genesis Apocryphon and Jubilees has amazing connections, which can't be coincidence. So whatever Genesis Apocryphon says, we can assume that Jubilees agrees with it because that's how closely related they are. Um, so, but I, never, I don't remember if it's both books or just Genesis Apocryphon, but either the one or both say that Sarah was taken for Pharaoh, but Sarah was protected and, and was not defiled by Pharaoh. On the other hand, uh, the second time with Abimelech, we're not told in Genesis Apocryphon how long because unfortunately that scroll broke off and the rest of it's not preserved. Um, in the actual scroll, the rest of it's missing. But in Jubilees, we are told that it only that that event happened only in a single month, within a single month. So we, we know from Jubilees that that whole scenario, his, the second time Abraham's wife was taken from him, lasted less than a month. That's what we can glean from, from uh, Jubilees. Now, we are told that Isaac was born in the third month. So he was born in the same month as Shavuot. And perhaps he was even born on Shavuot, but I don't think I don't think it actually says that. But he was born very close to Shavuot, so that's significant because Shavuot, according to Jubilees, is when is the day every year where you renew the covenant or people join the covenant, and that's what the Dead Sea Scroll people did. The Essenes they they had people join the covenant uh, at Shavuot every year. So Isaac was born and circumcised into the covenant very close or perhaps even on Shavuot. So that's an interesting detail. Now, uh, some people feel like Jubilee is sometimes out of order in certain places, but I think I, I found an example where I think that it's badly translated. I've talked a lot about a lot in my teachings how bad translations can like, really alter and misrepresent things. So, so what's interesting is it says in Jubilees, here's how they went render it. It says in chapter 16, verse 16, this is, this is after Isaac was already born. Isaac was born in verse 13, but in verse 16, it says, we returned in the and found Sarah with child before us, and we blessed him. That phrase, with child, that, that, in our minds, when we, someone says they're with child, it sounds like they're pregnant. But it doesn't. that doesn't seem to be what Jubilees is saying. Sarah wasn't pregnant because Isaac was born already. Instead, it's saying they found Sarah with her child in their presence. They found Sarah with her child, so with child. She was with the child before the angels, before us. So I think that's just an example of how the translation was badly worded because it took what the Ethiopian text said and rendered it in a way that it rendered it with an English phrase that we use differently. We use with child very differently. So I think that's why uh, there's confusion there. It's just because we, the translator translated it badly. Um, now, it says, as I mentioned the other time, Isaac was the first circumcised according to the covenant. Okay, so Abraham was circumcised, but according to Jubilees and the Torah, the covenant is to circumcise your children on the eighth day. And Abraham was not circumcised on the eighth day. So Isaac is considered the first person who was truly circumcised in accordance with the terms of the covenant, the eighth day. And we're told that Isaac was four months old when the angels returned to Abraham and Sarah. Now, what's interesting is Genesis tells us, Genesis tells us that it has the angels saying they would return to Sarah, but then it never, it's to Abraham and Sarah, but it never says in Genesis, like it never, it alludes to them returning, but it never tells us about them returning. So it's like, wait a minute, Genesis tells us they will return, but then they never return in Genesis. What happened? 
Well, Jubilees tells us what happened, that they returned and uh, it says more of what was spoken. And, and it was revealed to Abraham. Um, let's see. Is we returned in the seventh month, found Sarah with child before us, and we blessed him, and we announced to him all the things which had been decreed concerning him, that he should not die till he beget six more sons, and should see them he died. Because we know that Abraham later had more kids with Keturah. But according to Jubilees, when the angels returned, they declared to him ahead of time, Abraham, you're going to have more kids. You're going to have six more sons. We don't have any hint of that in Genesis. All we have is just Genesis saying, the angels are going to come back, and they're going to, something's going to happen when the angels come back, but we don't know what happens. But Jubilees tells us what happens, is that they have a conversation with Abraham, and bless him, and announce to him the future of what was going to happen for him. And then it says, after, after they said that to Abraham, then they went over to Sarah, and they told Sarah all that they had said to Abraham as well. After this, we have a very interesting thing. We have the origination of we have the origination of the Feast of Tabernacles. It says that Abraham was the first to, to, to do Feast of Tabernacles, the first on earth to do. It's possible that we do know Jubilees tells us that some of the other stuff like Sabbath and what was kept in heaven by the angels prior to any human keeping them on earth. So it's possible the same thing as the Feast of Tabernacles. But we're told on earth, Abraham was the first to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And it says, um, no uncircumcised person and no stranger was with them during the Feast of Tabernacles. So it, it appears to be the case that just like Passover, if you want to partake of Passover, you have to be circumcised. And in the same way, if you want to partake of tabernacles with Israel, you have to be uh, circumcised. Otherwise, you cannot dwell with them in, in the holy. Uh, it's, it's actually says, like in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the Temple Scroll, the, the Feast of Tabernacles was to, was to actually be observed in the temple area, in the courtyards. And according to the scriptures, no one who is uncircumcised, uh, no one who is circumcised is allowed to enter the courtyards of the temple. So keep tabernacles with Israel in the holy place, you had to circumcise yourself. Uh, so Jubilees, that, that teaching about Jubilees is, is in line with the Temple Scroll. And in harmony with the whole principle of being circumcised if you want to keep Passover. And it wouldn't make sense for the Creator to say, all the other festivals you can keep if you're uncircumcised, um, but only Passover, you can't. Like it makes sense. The like more majority of the holy days, you need to be circumcised because you have to be part of the covenant. Um, holy keeping these holy times is a holy thing, and you do it with the holy people. So to join them, you have to be circumcised and purify yourself to fellowship with them, with the holy people. That's what the teaching of Jubilees presents to us. But what's interesting is it tells us that um, Abraham was extremely joyful, rejoiced. It, sa it says, um, celebrated this feast during seven days, rejoicing with all his heart and with all his soul. And it says, called the name of this festival the festival of the Lord a joy acceptable to the Most High God. Um, this all throughout this chapter, it's just so weird and peculiar. It places a big emphasis on his joy, his rejoicing. So Abraham was truly joyful and, and greatly pleased with this whole thing. And it says, there's a little verse that's interesting. A verse says, he blessed his creator who had created him in his nation, for he had created him according to his good pleasure. And it says, for he, um, for Abraham, for he knew and perceived, uh, I'm sorry, um, hold on. They capitalize this in this translation, but we know capitalization is, is not original and that's interpretive. So I think it's wrong to capitalize it. And it says, for he, I think it's referring to Abraham, not 
the creator, for he knew and perceived that from him would arise the plant of righteousness for the eternal generations, and from him a holy seed, so that it should become like him who had made all things. What's really peculiar about that verse is it's, it, this whole chapter really illuminates a chapter of, from the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, I've told this story before, this, this interpretation before, but basically in the Gospel of John, you have the Messiah in the temple area during the Feast of Tabernacles and saying, when it was the Feast of Tabernacles, he was saying, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. So that doesn't seem to be coincidence that during the Feast of Tabernacles, he's saying, Abraham rejoiced to see the day of, to see my day. And what does Jubilee say during the Feast of Tabernacles? Abraham rejoicing. It says, why? It says, Abraham blessed his creator because he saw that from him, from himself, from Abraham, would arise the plant of righteousness, the Messiah, for eternal generations. And from him, a holy seed, that it should become like him who had made all things. So if this is the prophecy of the Messiah, Abraham saw the Messiah on the feast, during the Feast of the Tabernacles. He saw that the Messiah would come from him and that he would become like the Creator. So it appears that pointing us back and pointing us back to Abraham rejoicing to see the day of the Messiah uh, during the Feast of Tabernacles. So that's just an amazing connection there that I think is not coincidence. And there's other, all the other connections with the New Testament, too, of Jubilees, but that's one of the more interesting ones, I think. And there's also peculiar laws um, uh, for the Feast of Tabernacles that we don't see anywhere else. And we, I've talked about how the Temple Scroll has extra laws. So it appears to be that Jubilees is revealing to us uh, some of these extra laws that was once in the Temple Scroll, because the Temple Scroll has pieces missing. So we don't know all the laws that once were part of the Torah. But... Temple School gives us an extra, a good number of extra laws, gives us an idea of what we're missing. We know from the Temple School that there was plenty of extra laws for the Holy Days. We just don't know all those extra laws. But Jubilees reveals to us some of the extra laws for some of these Holy Days. And for Tabernacles, it tells us that it says, it is ordained forever regarding Israel that they should celebrate it and dwell in booths and set wreaths upon their heads and take leafy bows and willows from the brook. So it says, um, so set wreaths upon their heads. That's a tradition that's lost. That, that was commanded according to Jubilees. That was a command. They were supposed to wear wreaths on their heads. And then it says, they were to take leafy bows and willows from the brook, but it doesn't tell us what they would do with it. According to Jubilees, it looks like you use them to, to worship and praise. Um, a lot of people believe that you are to use those to build the, the, the tabernacles. You are to use the, the branches to build the tabernacles. But it appears, and it's telling us, that, we, that Abraham used those things just to, uh, to, to worship. It says he went around the altar with the branches seven times, in the morning and he praised and gave thanks so that may very well be one of the laws that for israel perhaps israel during the morning for tabernacles each day was supposed to go around uh the altar seven times and that brings me to uh, that just reminded me of another connection like when they went they went around uh i believe it was jericho they went around jericho seven times um for what seven days or something. I don't remember exactly, but they did something like that. So there does, uh, actually, let's look that up because that's an interesting thing. Um, let me look, let me see what that was because that might be parallel to this. Uh, that's just something that randomly came to my head. I didn't have that written down. So, um, okay. Um, oh, okay, so it says, you march around the city once, do that for six days, but then the seventh day, they marched around the city seven times, and then, then the walls came down. So, um, 
So let's see, what does it say again for Jubilees? It says every day he went around seven times. So it's not exactly the same thing, but it is interesting that parallel of going around seven times uh, has that significance. Now, let's see here. Okay. Now, what's interesting is Genesis Apocryphon has a section where Genesis, you know in Genesis it says that, um, let me read the part from Genesis where, it's, where it says, uh, it's when uh, Lot leaves Abraham and goes, decides to live in Sodom. Because uh, originally they were living together. So what it says is that it says there were strife between their shepherds, and then they have a conversation. Abraham says to Lot, I don't want there to be strife between us. Separate from us, take left or right, and you, you choose. So Lot chose. That whole scenario is missing from Genesis Apocrypha in the place that we expect it to be. It skips it. But Jubilees also skips it in that place. But then later on, Jubilee says, like at a later thing, it says, chapter 17, verse 3 of Jubilee, it says, and he remembered the words which he had spoken to him on the day on which Lot had parted from him. So, um, it, so it's pointing back. Uh, it's, um, backtracking and saying Abraham was remembering what happened with the whole thing with Lot. So it's very likely that Genesis Apocryphon followed the same uh, pattern as Jubilees and at this point Genesis Apocryphon backtracks and talks about um, basically after Isaac is born Genesis Apocryphon would have backtracked and recalled the conversation that uh, Abraham had with Lot. And it's important, these things are important because I'm trying to reconstruct these writings. And the best way to do that is to look at parallel sources. So Jubilees is very important for helping us fill in some of the missing pieces of the Genesis Apocrypha. Now, here's a interesting thing in Genesis, um, it talks about Ishmael, um, let's see, let me just get to that passage, okay, all right, so traditional interpretations are it says right here, um, this is from the New King James Version, and it says, Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, scoffing. And then you look at the, the footnote, and it says, literally, the word literally is laughing. So the translators thought, oh, um, Ishmael must be like mocking or something. And some of the rabbinic commentators believe that. They believe that Ishmael was mocking Isaac or something along those lines. Um, that's what, that's an interpretation you can get with Genesis. The Jubilees, you can't get that. Jubilees is very clear that what happened is that they were just having, they were just playing. Uh, it says, um, Sarah saw Ishmael playing and dancing and Abraham rejoicing with great joy. And she became jealous of Ishmael and said to Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son. Uh, so it wasn't because Ishmael was being a horrible son and was like mocking Isaac or anything silly like that. It was instead Ishmael was rejoicing with Abraham and, you know, and Abraham was like, um, it says um, Abraham was rejoicing with great joy. So imagine if you if Sarah saw Abraham being like extremely joyful, joyful over Ishmael, she would be concerned that he was being a little bit too joyful with Ishmael. 
So that explains why Sarah was jealous in the first place is because she was legitimately concerned that I, uh, that Abraham would be too much loving Ishmael and that Ishmael would take the place of Isaac. Um, it wasn't because Ishmael was uh, persecuting Isaac or anything like that. So that's the way that Jubilees can... There's so many interpretations people have with Genesis and other books of scripture, but when these other books are taken into consideration, we, if we hold them on an authority level, these extra details of Jubilees can help us refute false interpretations of scripture. So it is important for that purpose. Um, what's interesting is usually in, Gen in Jubilees, an angel will say, the, the angel of the Jubilees will say, we appeared to Abraham. We did this, we did that. But not in the case of, of Hagar. It says, uh, it says, when after Hagar was cast out, it says, an angel of God, one of the holy ones, said unto her, why weepest thou, Hagar? So it's interesting because most of the time, most of the time, in Jubilees, the angel says, we, or I, appeared so-and-so. But in this instance, he just says, an angel of God, one of the holy ones, said unto her. So that's just an interesting uh, difference. So I haven't figured out exactly why that is, but it may be that there's a meaning there for some reason that it's a special, uh, a specific angel, uh, maybe one of the archangels, uh, who knows, but apparently it wasn't grouped with the who was speaking in Jubilees. Now, Hagar for Ishmael, Ishmael has a son, and the son's name is Nebaioth. Genesis tells us that. It says, the firstborn of Ishmael, Nebaioth. And that's it. It doesn't tell us, um, it doesn't say why he was named Nebaioth. But we know, as I've mentioned in other teachings, Jubilees gives us a lot of information on why people were named what they were named. It gives us why a lot of the patriarchs were named what they were named. Um, so we see that Jubilees gives an emphasis on a lot of people's names that's in, that fills in some of those extra things. So it makes sense that Jubilees would also give us the meaning of of extra names like like Ishmael's son Nebaioth, and here's what we're told: uh, he was named Nebaioth. Ishmael named his son Nebaioth because no, she named him that. Actually, um, it looks like Hagar is the one. wait. Let me know. Hold on. Let me. No, no, no. The wife of Ishmael bear Ishmael's son and. Oh, that's it's confusing. Okay, so it says she bare him a son, and he called his name Nebaioth, for she said. So apparently, it was the woman that said something, and then and then Ishmael was like, oh, "Okay, I like that. I'm going to name him that." So his wife had said, "The Lord was nigh to me when I called upon him." So that's why Ishmael uh, named his son. Nebaioth. Um, so that's an interesting extra information there. Now, now we come to an interesting story, and that is the whole sacrifice of Isaac. And we um, we see that according to Jubilees. The chronology of Jubilees, like Genesis doesn't really tell us how old Isaac was. Jubilees tells us how old he was. Jubilees tells us Isaac was 21 when Abraham tried to kill him as a sacrifice. So Isaac was an adult. So it's unlikely that Abraham like kidnapped Isaac and tied him up and said, okay, you're coming with me, Isaac. So, for example, First Clement says Isaac, with perfect confidence, as if knowing what was to happen, cheerfully yielded himself as a sacrifice. So first Clement, which was authored by Clement of Rome, most likely, uh, believes that Isaac did that willingly. He followed Abraham willingly. 
And there's a Dead Sea Scroll fragment, which also has Isaac saying to Abraham, tie me up. So it has Isaac actually uh, explicitly saying, tie me up. And the way Genesis portrays it, it seems like some people think that like Isaac is like a little child and says like, Dad, where's the, uh, where's the offering? And then Abraham says, where, where's the animal, Dad? And then Abraham's like, it's okay. God will provide the animal. Meanwhile, he's getting the knife out and about to kill his little child. That's the way people portray it. But Jubilees presents it very differently where it has Isaac is a full-grown adult and he's willingly going up at first isaac's saying where where is the offering um and then abraham says he will provide an animal so perhaps perhaps isaac had this idea that like abraham uh perhaps they thought that maybe they maybe um that no matter what was going to happen isaac would still be preserved and that somehow Isaac would either be raised from the dead or would be spared. And so it seems like they were asking, where's the animal? Uh, where's the animal that uh, we can use to give an offering? Uh, and he says, Elohim will provide the offering. And of course, pr provide the animal. And the animal was provided uh, in the bushes, we know. So... Hebrews is the one that says that. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And it says, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. What the writer of Hebrews is implying is that Abraham first was told by the creator, your son Isaac will have many descendants. Now he's being told by the same creator, kill your son Isaac. So in Abraham's mind, he's like, okay, wait a minute. I was promised that he would have descendants. Now I'm being told to kill him. So the only logical conclusion is that Isaac must be raised from the dead after I kill him. That's the only way possible. For, for otherwise, the creator would be a liar. And Abraham knew he wasn't a liar, so he concluded, Isaac's not gonna be dead for good. If I kill him, he'll be raised from the dead. Or perhaps I won't have to kill him. And Abraham faithfully obeyed. And it tells us, it's very weird. We see it's very weird. Like, why did this happen? This whole story just doesn't seem to make sense. Why would Abraham, why would, why would the creator come to Abraham and say, kill your son? Immediately after blessing him and saying, you have, you know, Isaac will have many generations. Mm -hmm. Jubilees gives us that full story and tells us that it was, it was Mastima who came and said to uh, it, 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 it portrays the whole story like a Job-like scenario. The book of Job has Satan coming and saying, what about Job? Uh, let me uh, hurt him to test his faith. And the creator, in this case, uh, Satan did not hurt uh, Abraham, but he challenged the creator and said, you Basically, the reason this happened is it, it says that there were voices in the heavens that declared Abraham was super righteous and faithful and everything. And when Satan heard that, according to scripture, like Jubilees, Satan has a role of challenging, challenging people's claims to righteousness. So he came over and said, you claim Abraham's righteous, but he had in everything, but he hasn't been tested in all ways. See, um, Satan wanted control over Abraham, and the only way to do that is if he could prove that Satan, uh, that Abraham was not faithful. So it was, this was a test to, to see whether Satan could have authority over Abraham or not. And then the creator would prove that Abraham was truly loyal, and, a, and the creator could continue to have authority over, over Abraham. So, so Yehud didn't want to command Abraham to do that, but he only did that because he wanted to secure his right over Abraham. Because he gave the right to Satan to have authority over sinners for those who hand themselves over to Satan. The Creator only has authority over those who hand themselves over to him in righteousness. So, so 
this test was able to determine whether or not uh, the creator could continue to have authority over or Abraham, over Abraham. Um, and so what's also interesting is that throughout Jubilees it calls him Prince Mastima and we do know that the New Testament refers to Satan as the the Prince um, let's see where is it it says John 12 31 now that this is the Messiah I believe talking now is the judgment of this world now shall a prince of this world be cast out John 14 30 for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me uh, and 1611 and of judgment because the prince of this world is judged and then it says in Paul's writings in Ephesians according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience so this whole concept of the prince Satan being the prince in the New Testament that is ultimately derived from Jubilees that Jubilees is Prince Mastima he's Prince of of the world um, Now, let's see. All right. Um, I think what we'll do is I'm going to end soon. And, but there is one thing I'm going to skip ahead because it's so amazing. I'm going to skip to it. Like, I'm trying to go through Jubilees in order, but there is one thing I want to mention that's a little bit ahead. That's just really cool, and I'll mention that as like our closing. But um, so, so we're told in Jubilee that there's ten trials that Abraham had to endure, and that's actually taught also in rabbinic writings. The ten trials of Abraham. Now, the rabbinic writers disagree what those ten trials are, but we're told here are the ten trials according to Jubilee. So the ten trials of Abraham was um, departing from his country. The famine, because Abraham had to endure famine at that one time in the beginning. He was tested with the wealth of kings when his wife was torn from him with circumcision. So in other words, Jubilees understands that it's not easy for a full-grown man to circumcise himself because that would be painful. So that's a test. That's a commitment. A lot of people would not be willing to do that to themselves. So for Abraham to do that, that's a very faithful thing. And that, that was a trial. With Ishmael and Hagar, that was a trial uh, because he had to send them away. That was, that was difficult for him to do. The sacrifice of Isaac, that was a trial. And then the Sarah's death, that was a trial. And then the burial of Sarah, it tells us that that was a trial. Now, it tells us that the mountain Isaac was sacrificed on was Mount Zion, or that he was almost sacrificed on, that was Mount Zion. And then we see in one place, it says that the angels speak to Abraham in Yahuwah's name on Yahuwah's behalf. So that's an interesting thing as well. Sometimes when we see angels speak, they speak for Yahuwah, but they're not actually Yahuwah. And also what's interesting is throughout Genesis and Jubilees, there's different blessings. Like he's blessed one time. Then a little bit later, on a different occasion, he's blessed a different time. If you look closely, like at first, at first glance, you might think all the blessings are the same, but they're not. The blessings have different terms. So each time Abraham did something else, a special thing, he was blessed further with a further blessing. So each time a new blessing came, uh, each time a new activity happened that was very significant, he received a new blessing from Yahuwah. So it's, I would say it's very, it would be very interesting study to look into the differences for the blessings and how that progressed. And we're told that um, because, let me see, it's a, it tells us the origin, okay, so it tells us, um, I think it says, I think this is in the first month. Let me see, where, where does it say the first month? 
Yeah, okay. So it says in Jubilees that he, during the first month, this was when the test happened to uh, sacrifice his son Isaac. After he did that, then it says Abraham left, and then he celebrated the festival seven days with joy. Call it a festival of the Lord according to the seven days during which he went and returned in peace. And accordingly has it been ordained and written on the heavenly tablets regarding Israel and its seed, that they should observe this festival seven days with the joy of the festival. What tells us is that Jubilees is saying that those seven days of unleavened bread originated with Abraham when, um, when uh, Isaac was nearly sacrificed. So it's one, one of the really cool things of Jubilees is it goes through each holy day and tells us when it originated. Uh, it tells us Shavuot was first kept by Noah, seven days of unleavened bread, and Feast of Tabernacles first kept by Abraham. Jacob was the one who first kept the Day of Atonement and... and uh, the eighth day, the day after Tabernacles, because there's eight days, the seven days of Tabernacles, and then the eighth day is the great day. The, the seven days originated with Abraham, the eighth day originated with Jacob. That's what Jubilees tells us. And of course, we know Passover originated with Moses. So we, we see in Jubilees the origin of each holy day. So that's really cool. The only one we don't see is the, um, we don't see um the feast of trumpets we don't see that one in jubilee so there could be two reasons for that one it could, could just be a corruption or perhaps jubilee speaks of four the four new month days and it says it's the first of each month of the first of the fourth First of the first month, first of the fourth month, first of the seventh month. So maybe Jubilees doesn't consider the Feast of Trumpets to be separate and considers it the same. That's a possibility. Uh, that could explain the absence of Feast of Trumpets from Jubilees. Now, when it, it, said, it, it praises Abraham for being patient when Sarah died because it says Abraham could have, you know, he could have, when, when he went to the children of Heth, he could have said, this land is mine. The creator gave this to me. You must let me bury Sarah here. He could have said that, but that would have been a very bad witness. The people would have been very, they would have thought he was an arrogant man and very wicked uh, to impose himself like that. But he didn't do that. He didn't, he didn't uh, impose himself on people. Abraham was very kind and was very humble and said, I will pay what this is valued at. That is, that is your, this is your land and I know you will give it to me for free, but I don't want, I don't want you to do that. It's very important to me uh, that, that you, uh, uh, that I pay the full price in fairness. So he was being, Jubilees praises that as a very righteous, faithful thing because he was patient and didn't get snappy and upset when, when his wife died. Uh, and, you know, people could be like that when they're trying to do the funeral stuff. They get very uptight. But Abraham was not uptight. He didn't, he wasn't impatient. So that was praised a lot. And so, um, Two final things will say this. Uh, people, there's there's a there's a bunch of people you'll see on, you'll see them on um, on Facebook. You'll see there's a bunch of people who are saying really bad things about Yahuwah. Um, one guy in particular, I think his name is Rich Grundy. I think his name is. Um, I'm Facebook friends with him, but I don't really have much in common with him. And one of the things he says is like. He just he speaks against the Torah. He speaks against the Bible a lot, and and he it's one of those things where people don't believe. People uh, oppose the animal sacrifices. It's one thing to oppose the animal sacrifices, but he takes it to a next level. He like he thinks like the God of the Bible, Yahuwah, is basically like an evil being, like a Satan or something. Uh, anyway, there's this really. 
there's this really bad meme that's being spread around, which has the words, like it basically takes the story of Abraham and mocks it and makes it sound like Abraham was a crazy person because he was willing to murder his own son Isaac. And is basically portraying that as a very wicked thing. Uh, I would challenge that thinking because here's why. Life and death is in the hand of the creator, is it not? Um, is it? The creator gave us life, and at any time he, ta he gives life, he takes away life. So isn't it 100% within the right of the creator to, if he wants a sacrifice, can he say, can he not say, I want you to kill these animals? He doesn't have to tell us why. If, if he says it, do this for me, that's his, he's, he's the king of life. So if he demands life back, that's his prerogative. Who are we to oppose the creator and say no? Um, it's the same thing with, with human sacrifices. We know it doesn't actually say in scripture that human sacrifice is abomination. It actually says sacrificing to other gods is an abomination. But nowhere does scripture say that human sacrifice is acceptable, and nowhere does it say that it's unacceptable. We know from implication that it's unacceptable because humans are not clean animals, and we know that we were told in the Torah only clean animals are to be sacrificed. But Yahuwah could have easily changed his mind and before he could have, instead of commanding that, he could have said, no, command, uh, I want you to sacrifice unclean animals. He could have chosen uh, that if he wanted it, but he didn't want that for his reasons. And he made humans in the in the image of him. So I think the reason he didn't command human sacrifice is because he had mercy and compassion. He and he didn't need he doesn't need sacrifice. He didn't want it. So he simply had no reason to ask for it. So he didn't ask for human sacrifice. But he certainly could have if he wanted to. And if he had, the whole world would be different because we do know in ancient cultures why they practice human sacrifice. And why they do that? Because they have the same perspective. If it, if it was their, their God wanted it, then that's what they wanted. Um, it's this understanding that, you know, we might, from our culture, we might say, I would never do something so heinous. But that's from our, the culture we're raised up in. What if we're raised up in a culture where it's acceptable? If we were raised up several hundred years ago, we would probably be raised up thinking slavery is fine. We're raised up in a culture that thinks slavery is not fine now. So now we have that, we have that default assumption and bias that, that slavery is bad. It's the same thing. Uh, no matter what, we're raised up in a particular bias. That bias could be righteous, it could be good, or the bias could be wrong. So we have to be understanding that there were different cultures that had different perspectives and if we try to think about f things from a biblical perspective of the ancient times, uh, there, there was uh, the, the culture they lived in. Abraham lived in a culture of, of human sacrifice. The nations around him sacrificed humans all the time, Sumerians, you know? So when Abraham was living amongst those people, it wasn't outside the norm of culture for the creator to say, sacrifice, sacrifice your son Isaac. The only reason Abraham thought that was strange was because that was contradicting the promise that he had been given. He didn't, Abraham wasn't thinking, wait a minute, human sacrifice is an abomination. Abraham was thinking, wait a minute, you said that Isaac was going to have many children. How is that possible if I kill him? That's what Abraham was thinking. He wasn't thinking, um, no, human sacrifice is an abomination. I'll, I'll do this abomination anyway, because you told me to. From Abraham's perspective, he didn't conceive of it necessarily as an abomination. Um, so I think there is a perspective of how do we view the creator? Um, and we have assumptions that may not be accurate. And there was a time in the past, there was a time where I thought, if the creator tells me to do something evil, I will not do it. That was my small thinking though, because um, if the creator tells you to do something, well, you have to know it you have to know without a shadow of a doubt that it is, in fact, the creator. If you don't know it's the creator, then you should not obey the voice. Because we do know Satan can talk with people. We know 
we know angels can talk with people. So you will have to be absolutely sure that it is the creator talking with you. If you know for a fact, like Abraham did, that it's the creator talking, then in my perspective, I think we should do whatever, whatever he says. Because, for example, if he, if he says, go kill that random person, we don't know why he wants us to kill that person, but what if that person is like a horrible murderer and is about to kill someone else? Is about to commit a heinous crime? We don't have that knowledge, but we have the faith that the creator knows what he's telling us, and so we're gonna, we will do this on the creator's behalf. If we kill someone innocent, it's not on us, it's on the creator. If we, if we murder someone because we're obeying the creator and who is innocent and didn't deserve to die, then th that blood is on the creator. If anyone is guilty of sin, then it would be the Creator who commanded you to do that. You would not be in sin because you're just obeying in faithfulness uh, what the Creator said. I used to think differently, but I, that's my take on it now. I think you follow whatever the Creator says. Um, you know, if um, it's just there's many ways to understand. Like it could be a test for different things. Uh, so, all I have to say, I, I, I do think our perspective on the whole sacrifice thing is misguided from our culture that we might have a repulsion to human sacrifice, but that's only because we were raised up to think that way. But from a biblical perspective, um, there isn't necessarily that same repulsion. All we know from the scripture perspective is that there never was a human sacrifice that was ever acceptable. And uh, it, would have been, it would have been considered against the Torah because only clean animals are to be sacrificed. But according to Ezekiel, you know what Ezekiel ha happened in there? We were told that um, uh, Yahuwah appeared to Ezekiel and said, I want you to eat your, f I want you to cook food over human poop, basically. He basically said, take human excrement, cook it in a, cooking pot as oil, cooking oil, and have food over it and eat the food in front of everybody. And Isaac, uh, Ezekiel was like, please don't make me do this. This is unclean. This is against the Torah. I don't want to do this. The creator had mercy on him and said, okay, I won't force you to do that. But he definitely commanded him to do something that was against the Torah. But it's one of those things, like in the New Testament, writing extra, you know, the Apocrypha stuff, it says that a bunch of the apostles drank poison and did not get harmed by it. So it's very possible that if the creator commands you to eat an unclean animal, the poison that's normally in the unclean animal, you could be spared from. He's not going to tell you, okay, you can eat unclean animals now whenever you want. He's not going to say that. But there may be a time where he tells someone to eat an unclean animal and it's not going to harm. The reason it's a sin to eat unclean animals is because it's unhealthy. But the Creator can make it healthy in a specific instance by miraculous intervention if he wants for some reason. And that's what I think was going to happen with Ezekiel. I think when he commanded Ezekiel to eat the, that food over that, the, uh, the unclean oil that he was going to use, he was going to protect Ezekiel's health. But he wanted, to do, he wanted Ezekiel to do that to give an image to Israel, a prophetic, a strong prophetic message. Uh, so that's my take on it. If, if, if you will command you to do something, do it, no matter what it is. However, you better be damn sure that that is the creator talking, because if it's not, then, then you are fully culpable, culpable for that sin. And a lot of people have done horrible things in the name of the creator, thinking the creator talked to them, but the creator did not talk to them. Um, okay, so I guess, oh, I did, I did say the final thing that I'm going to mention. It's a little bit farther. The final thing is very cool. You know, this Luke chapter 16 speaks of the Abraham's bosom. You wonder, why does it say Abraham's bosom? Well, what's really cool is Jubilees has a story about Abraham's bosom and it connects it with death. So it appears that the whole Abraham's bosom thing is linked to Jubilees. Uh, so I'll, I'll give more detail on that in the next teaching about Abraham's bosom. But I'm, that's a little bit of a, a snippet for you. That's kind of a very cool thing to me that just shows a connection with the New Testament.
it, it reinforces Jubilee's importance uh, to, the, to the writers of the New Testament. Last year, I had a guy write in to me about circumcision. And I said, as far as I'm concerned, yes, circumcision is required. The reason it doesn't mention it in Acts 15 is because it's something that would come along with your Torah study eventually. This guy said that he was told to get circumcised. And he just wanted to make sure that the word was true that he got, and it wasn't from somewhere else. And I, I said, you have to make that decision, but yes, it's still valid for today. And so about a month later, he wrote back and said that he did it. I wow. mean, he did it himself. Oh, wow. <laughs> Can you imagine that? But again, he said, I felt such relief when it was done. I felt like I had fulfilled what I was told by the Creator, and now I'm fulfilled. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, the, the, Paul says, um, I interpret what Paul says not in a negative way, like a lot of people interpret it in a negative way, but he says, like, if you become circumcised, the entire law is binding. A lot of people take that as a negative thing. But I think he's saying, understand that that's a big commitment. If you decide to become circumcised, the entire law is binding on you. And um, there is a New Testament Apocrypha writing. I don't know. The, the, the particular passage is in the Arabic version, but it's not in the Ethiopian. So it, it could be an interpolation. But what it says is basically the Messiah is speaking with Peter and says, tell the believers that um, the, it's up to them if they want to be circumcised or not. If they want to, that's, that's for them. And if they don't want to, um, so that could be an interpolation. But I, I think that from my perspective, I used to think what you said, that we all need to be circumcised eventually. Um, however, I'm kind of leaning more towards the view that circumcision is uh, st still binding, but it's only required for Israel, the, the blood of Israelites, and then uh, it's optional for Gentiles. If Gentiles do it, specifically to enter the Old Covenant, then they become an Israelite and they have to keep the whole Israelite covenant. Whoops, uh, you're, you're muted. This uh, Lex Cornelius, I've I mentioned this several times before because it's mostly unknown, but in the time of Paul going up to Europe, to circumcise somebody was, it was a capital crime because it would it was considered mutilating the person's gen genitals. And so I'm kind of thinking maybe if Paul wants to go up into Macedonia or go up to Italy, and, and uh, he would definitely have to nullify that part of the Torah because he, he was well known in imperial circles. And look, he's going around cutting people's genitals he is opening himself up to well the punishment is the sword whatever that means I well it's definitely a very difficult thing for people to do you know it's a for babies because they don't you know they're not going to remember it but. yeah okay great any any final thoughts people any questions let's see you got a chat thing all right. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, any follow-up questions, you can ask on Facebook. Uh, we'll we'll do the. Well, I think mm, I actually can't do it next week. Uh, I'm going to be away, so we'll skip next week. Um, okay, we'll do something next week. I'll, okay. I'll announce it until you can get back. Uh, we really appreciate you doing this. We you know we don't have many for this, but as I said, Jubilees. Not many people know about the book in any way, and we're here because we desire to learn, and we are uh, really putting together a good set of teachings here. One thing that we might want to do is go through at least the podcast and decide decide where you're at in the book, and maybe do a follow along. You know what I'm saying? Uh, what do you mean? Like today you said, we're right in the middle of Abraham's life. What would that, what would that, um,
correspond with in the actual text? Oh, we're like right around like chapter 21 about. Okay. Yeah, yeah. so I, I thought go through and just to make a note inside the podcast to say where we are at that time. So if somebody wanted to go through it, I, I'm thinking that maybe it would be more helpful to take the book out and go through it as we go. So we oh, okay. see these texts or no, maybe project that portion on the screen, something like that. Okay. That's something we can try to, okay. I can try to incorporate. Um, one okay. final thing, Charles, uh, Jackson has the previous videos of Jubilees on his YouTube channel. And I also have them on mine. So you can go to either of our YouTube channels to catch up on the previous ones we did. Right. You can go to JS Presents. They're all right there in a row. Their podcast, the, the video is not there. I know that the people that are studying along with you in Canada were a little concerned because they didn't know that they were on uh, either YouTube or on the podcast. They were looking to Hebrew Nation Radio just to get those podcasts. But the problem I have there now is they're only allowing me to put up one a day, and I'm behind. Uh. So I'm trying to get caught up. I probably have three more to go for podcasts. So anyway, if if you hear people wanting to get back in, uh, make sure that you guide them to YouTube or to jspresents.org, one of the two. Okay? Uh, thank you very much, guys. You. See you next time.